It's great to be with you tonight, uh, but I have to say, not under the circumstances that I am here. Um, just thinking about your pastor at this time, I know it's been a very difficult time this last couple of years for him. Ken rang me, um, really in a state of an emergency on Friday night, so um, under the circumstances, um, I was more than happy to fill in for him, and I pray that um, you'll get something out of what um, I have to bring tonight. Um, if you have your Bible with you, would you please open with me at Acts chapter 26. At Acts 26, I just want your eyes to fall upon one verse tonight and it's verse 28 of Acts chapter 26. Before we read God's word, can we just pray together again? Thank you. Father, thank you that we serve the true and the living God. And Lord, especially when we see what's happened over this weekend on our television sets and the tragedy that took place there in Paris, men pledging allegiance to a God that cannot save and cannot hear. We thank you that you're the Prince of Peace. And we thank you that you're the God who hears and answers prayer tonight. And so we would come and lift up our voices to you. And we pray that the words of our mouth and the meditations of our heart would be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Father, we've offered our praise to you. And now we come to you in prayer asking you that you would bless your own inspired word and Holy Spirit, we know that nothing can be accomplished apart from you. And so we ask you that you would still every heart. And if there's a man or a woman or a young person in this house tonight that still is outside the safety of Jesus Christ, that, Lord, you would do that wonderful work of salvation in their hearts and in their lives. May we leave here at the end of this night saying, it was good for us to be here, for it was here that we met with the Lord. Father, would you remember your servant at this time? Thank you for his faithfulness week after week in proclaiming the gospel. Thank you that he's here in season and out of season. And Lord, he's been through a difficult time, but you know all about that. And I pray, would you be with him? Would you be with the family at this particular time, this difficult time? So our thoughts just go to him right now. Would you bless him, Father, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen context of this chapter is too lengthy to read the whole lot of it, but um, the Apostle Paul finds himself imprisoned because of the testimony um, of Jesus Christ. He's at a place called Caesarea Philippi, and he's standing trial before a king called Herod Agrippa. And Paul here, of course, standing before Herod in chains, tells his testimony about how the Lord Jesus had arrested him on the road to Damascus and about the change that it came about since then. And, and, and we're told these words, <clears throat> that he lays it on the line with Agrippa and asks Agrippa, do you believe the law and the prophets? And listen to what Agrippa says in the light of all the things that Paul had to say to him in verse 28. He says, then Agrippa said unto Paul, almost you persuaded me to be a Christian. Friends, these words spoken by this King Herod Agrippa, I feel are amongst the most tragic in all of the Scriptures. Why? Because they suggest that this man was on the threshold of entering into that state of eternal life. He was so close to possessing the greatest gift a man, a woman, or a young person can ever possess only when to be standing right on the threshold of heaven, he takes a step back. Almost, he said, you persuaded me to be a Christian. Friend, hear me tonight. It is a tragedy, but it's possible to stand at the door of heaven and never enter into eternal life. It's possible to have God prompt you time after time, yet never take that final step to become a Christian. This was Herod Agrippa. You know, I don't believe for a moment that this was the first time God had spoken to this man. I believe God had prompted him time after time. How do we know that? Because Paul says to him in verse 27, 
He says, King Agrippa, do you believe the law and the prophets? In other words, do you believe that the Bible is true? Paul says this, I know that you do. It seems that Paul knew something of this man's open stance towards Christianity. How? Well, perhaps some Christians in the region had informed Paul that that Agrippa was sympathetic to the Christian faith. Perhaps at that moment, God showed Paul supernaturally that Agrippa's heart was open. Or perhaps as the apostle gives his masterful address, the conviction was showing on the face of the king. Perhaps he was even sweating as Paul was speaking. I don't know really how, but Paul knew Agrippa was not far from the kingdom. He was ripe for salvation, and yet what a tragedy, even though God was speaking to this man, and he wasn't far away, he refused to take that final step. He says, verse 28, oh, good sermon, Paul, but you almost persuaded me. I wonder, am I talking to someone in this house tonight, and God has been prompting you like this man? Your heart is open. You're but a step from becoming a Christian. Friend, my prayer is that you would not leave this service like Agrippa saying, all good service, sermon, Stuart. You almost persuaded me. No. My prayer is that the words of Paul in verse 29, you would be all together like we are tonight. But this happens today. There are modern-day Agrippas in every church and in every walk of society. Those who almost make it but never take that final step. Who are there amongst us that are always almost Christians? Well, here's the first category of people that I have found are always almost Christians sometimes. It's the children, teenage children of Christian parents How often are these always almost Christians? It's alarming how many of our children are so close and so familiar with the things of God and yet never make that full commitment. They come to church week after week and if they're like my children, they come to church kicking and screaming under duress. They hear the sermons until they're coming out their ears. They could pray the prayers for us. They know the songs. They may even join in. They enter into the Christmas plays at, at, different, at different times of the year. And they take the bread and wine as well sometimes. And we can almost take it for granted that they're Christians. But in many instances, they're not. Why? Because they haven't yet made that decision to accept the Lord Jesus as their own and personal Savior. And I want to address Christian teenagers tonight, or so-called Christian teenagers I want to tell you that I love you and that I care for you. But because I do, I'm going to tell you the truth, young man and young woman. I want you to know that although you're loved, that almost being persuaded is not enough. Coming through the doors of the church week on week won't save you. Listening to the sermons, singing the songs, acting in the Christmas plays, taking the bread and the wine, even if you do it by default, it won't save you. You must take that final step through the door of heaven to take Christ as your own and personal Savior. One man told me this one time, and there was never a truer statement said. He said, Stuart, never forget, God does not have grandchildren. And what this man was saying is that for Christian children, the children of Christian parents coming to church, you can't go to heaven on your mom and dad's ticket. You need to have your own personal experience. Verse 29, you almost and all together need Christ as your Savior, or else this is the worst thing. Where your mom and dad are going, you may not be able to come. Then there's a second group of people, not just the children of Christian parents, The second group who are always almost Christians are the regular church attender. How often are these always almost Christians? And I've seen millions of these. And so have you, regular sermon tasters. They breeze in and out when they please, usually out of a sense of bogus fear. They enjoy the singing. Enjoy the sermon. Sometimes they can be moved to tears as they mingle in the holy atmosphere. They come to the church events and they enjoy them also, but their emotions never bring them to the place of repentance. I wonder, am I talking to someone like this tonight? You come here and you take pride 
at being at the services. Friend, hear me, I love you tonight. Because I love you, I'm also going to tell you the truth. Going to church does not make you a Christian. As one man says, like going to McDonald's doesn't make you a hamburger. (laughs) You come through the doors. You're almost there. You're in the premises. But can I ask you this? Are you standing on the promises of God? You can have all the fun with us as Christians. You can enjoy good times and we will welcome you. But if you're not going to accept Christ, then you're going to attend, you're going to fellowship, you're going to laugh, and you may even cry yourself to a lost eternity. Externals and emotions are not enough. You must all together be as we are tonight. Then there's a third group. And I call them the religious church goer. These again are different from the regular church attender who knows that they're sinners but just won't commit. The religious, however, feel that their own good works will merit them favor with God. These are ten a penny. Catholics and other main street ch- stream churches, even some non-church goers come under this banner. Someone says, I've been confirmed. <laughs> I'm on the church rule. I was sprinkled as an infant. I've given to the church. Oh, I fed the poor. Listen to this one. I'm a good person. Hello. Hear me, my religious friend. It doesn't matter whether you've been confirmed, baptized as an infant. It doesn't matter that you've given to the poor or the church. It doesn't matter that you're a good person or even that your name is on the roll. Do you know what I've wrote here? Your name might as well be on a sausage roll. Because if Christ is not dwelling in your heart by faith, you're always going to be almost a Christian. Religion can't save you. Good works or your own righteousness can't save you. They all fall short of the glory of God. Can I hear an amen tonight? Paul says in Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. My religious friend tonight, If you're to take that final step, you need to trust not on your own merits, but on the merits of Christ's sacrifice for you, for this is the only thing that God accepts. Religion will always keep you almost a Christian. But then there's another category of people. Listen to this one. There's the husband and wife of a believing partner. The husband and wife. You know who I'm thinking of when I think of this? My wife's grandfather, George Perry. We Barbara Perry used to go to the Whitewell Church for years, and George used to go with her every Sunday night religiously. And he used to listen to some of the most fiery, powerful sermons uh, from the ministry of Pastor James McConnell. And you know, he used to go out after the service and stand at the, at the fountain And then he would have went from the fountain after shaking hands with people and went to the door and shook hands with people. And a wee man came up to me one night and says, is he a Christian? Or no, is he a pastor? I says, he's not even a Christian. (laughs) And he's almost there. I went to visit him the other week. He's almost there. But as he has continued to harden his heart, the voice of God grows dim. And as the scripture says, In his life, the summer has ended and the harvest has passed. He's in his latter years and he's still not saved. Maybe you're like that tonight. You've got a partner who's a Christian and when they're around the house, you're so familiar with the things of God. They bring you to church. You've heard the sermons. You understand. You've been touched. But you've drew back from committing and now those same sermons don't have that same effect on you. Friend, hear me. I would pray you would not go on in your ears and die in that almost state for you also will be lost. So here's four categories of people who I think are always almost Christians some of the time. But as we move on, I want you to see in closing three reasons why people remain always almost Christians. And the first reason is this. The first reason... People remain always almost Christians. It's because they're looking for some sort of emotion or visual visual sign. I was a young man in Lurgan. 
About a year ago, I was taking a football dinner and I gave my testimony and I come down from speaking and I went to the door to greet people and the young man come up to me and he says, Stuart, footballer myself, I was really convicted by what you had to say tonight. And, and you know, my mom and dad are Christians and I'm just, you, you can understand, I've been going to church for a while, but I'm just waiting for that, you know, that emotion to spring up in me and that visual sign, if you like. I said to him, well, sir, you're going to be waiting a while because it's got nothing to do with emotions. I said to him, the Bible says, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll be saved. I said, emotions will come afterwards. Just get right with God tonight. And I can only pray that that young man took my advice and and went and accepted Jesus Christ as Savior. The religious Jews during our Lord Jesus' time said, do you remember he came proclaiming that he was the Messiah? And they said to him, except we see a sign from heaven, we won't believe that you're the Messiah. And listen to what Jesus said to them. An evil and adulterous generation seeks a sign. No sign shall be given them except the sign of Jonah. As Jonah was three days in the belly of the whale, so shall the Son of Man be three days in the heart of the earth. You know what the Lord Jesus was saying to these people? The only sign you're ever going to get is my death, burial, and resurrection. You don't believe that, you'll never become a Christian. Luke 16, we hear the story, a very sobering story, of the rich man and Lazarus. Who told that story? The Lord Jesus himself. This rich man, he fared sumptuously every day. The Bible says in our words, that would mean he was was loaded. Millionaire. And there was this beggar, Lazarus, who used to lie at his gate every day, just begging for the crumbs that fell from this rich man's table. The dogs came and licked the sores and there wasn't even a crumb given to him. There came a day, the Lord Jesus said, of reckoning. And Lazarus, after he closed his eyes in this world, opened his eyes in another and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom, this rich man, we're told, also opened his eyes and in hell he found himself in torment. And he cried out, Father Abraham, because he's seen Abraham and Lazarus afar off, he said, Father Abraham, send Lazarus the beggar that he may just dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue because I am tormented in this flame. And listen to what Abraham said to him, Son, remember that in your lifetime you received all of these wonderful things and likewise Lazarus the evil things, but now the tables have turned, he is being comforted and you're being tormented. Besides all this, there's a great gulf fix between us and you. You can't come to where we are and we can't come to where you are. Now listen to this. Lazarus, or sorry, the rich man says, well, Father Abraham, if I can't get out of here, I want you to do something for me. Would you send the beggar Lazarus back from the dead? Because I have five brothers in the land of the living. And if they could just see Lazarus appear before them, surely they would believe. Now listen to what Abraham replies in verse 31 of Luke chapter 16. And he said unto him, If they hear not Moses and the prophets, in other words, if they don't believe the Bible, neither will they be persuaded that one was to come back from the dead. Friend, if you need a sign or some sort of emotion before you'll come to Christ tonight, you will always remain almost a Christian. God requires faith. Then there's a second reason why people remain almost Christians, not just because they're looking for some sort of emotion or visual sign before they'll take a first step, but what about this one? They think they have more time. (laughs) That was Felix in Acts chapter 24. Like Agrippa, this man called for Paul to hear about the faith in Jesus Christ. And we're told why Paul reasoned of righteousness and temperance and judgment to come. Felix was trembling. But listen to what Felix replies in Acts 24, verse 25. He says, go your way for this time. When I have a convenient season, I'll send for you. This man was very presumptuous, by the way. Because the Bible never tells us that that convenient season came. A few years later, a man called Festus, another Roman governor, comes in, takes over from Felix. Felix goes off the pages of the Bible and out into history. And we don't know where he is tonight. This is the biggest gamble of all. 
being almost there, but putting it off to another time. Friend, tell, I want to tell you tonight, you might not have that time, for this might be the last time that God ever speaks to you. And I'm not saying that you might never come to church again, but I've seen people sit in pews and just know that God has passed them by while they're even sitting in their seat. You ever see, hear the story of the apprentice devils? Pastor McConnell told it a few times. I've stole it from him. <laughs> Satan, the prince of demons, has wanted to recruit another couple of demons in his school. And there's two apprentices, and he calls them both in one by one. And the first one comes in, and Satan asks him this key question. And he said, what would you tell a man, woman, or a young person in order to keep them from coming to Jesus Christ? And the first apprentice devil says, Master Satan, I would tell them that there's no God. And Satan says, sorry, you, you don't qualify because there might be who, people who call themselves atheists out there, but what they really are is agnostics. They don't have all the facts because Romans chapter 1 says even the invisible things of God are clearly, are, are clearly manifested in the wonderful creation that we see all around us. And also the very law of God is written on our conscience, Paul says, so that they are without excuse. He says they might seem like atheists, but what they are is agnostics. You don't qualify. Everyone deep down in their innermost recesses knows that there is a God. So off he goes. Calls the second one and what would you tell a man, woman, or a young person in order to keep them from coming to Jesus Christ? And he says, Master Satan, I would tell them that they can come back next week. And he says, you're the one that I'm looking for. They'll buy it every time. And he will whisper that to you on see a friend tonight. Next week. Come back next week. I want to tell you something you might not have next week told this story numerous times, but I'll tell it again. I remember standing East Yorkshire, Alborough one night, preached the gospel with all of my heart. There was four people responded. I was rejoicing. But again, as I do, I stood at the door and I, and I was saying cheerio to people. And an elderly man come out and he says, young man, that really tugged at my heart tonight. And I said, sir, are you a Christian? He says, no, I'm not. I'm nearly there. I said, sir, please don't put it off. Getting up into the pulpit at Living Hope Church in Hull the week after, my good friend Mary Yurkovich, a member of our church, comes to the pulpit, just stands in front of me, says, Stuart, were you in Albra during the week? I says, I was, Mary. He says, were you talking to an elderly man at the door about his need of a saviour? I says, I was, Mary. She says, his family have sent a message to you to say that he took a massive heart attack on his driveway and was launched out into eternity. He wasn't right with God. The devil whispered that night to him, come back next week. That man never made it to next week. Do you know what the Bible says? Behold, now is the accepted time. Now is the day of salvation. And here's another reason why people remain always almost Christians. Not just that they're looking for some sort of sign or emotion, but they always think they have more time. That is certainly not the case. I'm finishing. But the last reason why people I've found remain always almost Christians is that they feel they can't leave this world behind. That's the ultimate reason Herod Agrippa couldn't take the final step. No doubt he admired Paul. He secretly inclined to the scriptures of truth, but ultimately the world with its sinful pleasures and desires, mattered much more to this man. And I want to set up the scene for you. Here's Paul. Paul's supposed to be the prisoner standing in chains, but who really was the prisoner? It was Agrippa, seated upon his throne in pomp. Paul's standing before him. And while Paul is talking about the reality of the things of God, can't you see it? There's a war going on inside Agrippa. He's saying, I'm coming. I'm coming to Christ. And then there's another part of him saying, but hold it. If I pledge my allegiance to Christ, the heavenly king, I'm going to have to, to go to Rome and, and, and explain to Caesar, my earthly king, as to why um, I've turned away from him. And then he looks to either his left or his right, and his wife was standing beside him. 
And he thinks to himself, there's no way I can commit. Do you know why? Because he was married to his sister. He wants to come, but he thinks about his prestige. He thinks about his position. He thinks about his palace. And the the pull of the world is just ultimately too strong for him. Can't you hear him? Paul, almost you persuaded me to be a Christian, but I can't give it all up. I wonder, am I talking to you, Agrippa, tonight as I close? You're touched by the gospel. You admire the people of God, but you cannot follow because it would mean you renouncing your allegiance to other things and other people. Friend, hear me. I say this in love. If you can't turn your back on those things, you will always be almost a Christian and you can live for the temporary pleasures of sin. And I can assure you, if you reject Jesus Christ, you will go to a lost eternity. And as Paul poured out his heart to this king that day, urging him to turn, I also plead with you tonight, I urge you in this house who are almost there, not to just almost become a Christian, but right now, not tomorrow, but now, all together, be as many of us are tonight, fully fledged followers of Jesus Christ. I'm done. It's been a hard-hitting message, I know, but friend... Eternity is long, and heaven's doors open. Do you know what? You're standing on the threshold. Perhaps there's someone here and has been standing on the threshold for a long time. What a tragedy. I've seen this so many times, and it's almost heartbreaking. Men and women coming through the doors of the church, and then just being so close, and for one reason or another, they just take that step back. And you go, hey boy. Friend, I pray that there'd be no one in here like that tonight. Just take that step and accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. All of these reasons, let nothing hold you back. I pray that God the Holy Spirit would convict you of your sins tonight and that you would surrender your life to Jesus Christ. May God bless every one of you. Thank you for your attention. Thanks. I'm going to hand it back to Gary. Thank you.